Um, so yeah, so that brings us up to you know the the modern the modern era of Bond, and this is in many ways where it gets the most interesting because it's now up until current day, but also brings in all the changes that the Bond films have made and what some people would say need to still make or or different directions. But Casino Royale was a huge shift in, um, would you say that they were more self-aware now as perhaps yeah, I, I think it was just like everything else at that time. This is a post 9-11 world. Everything got more serious. That's why the Die Another mm -hmm. Day thing shifted. And you had the, obviously everyone talks about the Bourne movies had come out. And yeah. the Bourne movies are a big hit. And there was that sense of realism and, that, and the, the speed of it. You know, really the pace of the way the movie and the action flowed was different. And, you know, Batman Begins had come out. And, you know, Casino Royale was the epitome of that time period where everything was getting real and, and gritty and, and more based in reality and what if it really happened and, it, and they basically i think they just approached it like okay <laughs> what if james bond really existed you know what, what's yep. the realistic version of james bond and then that's obviously still in quotations because it's a spy film but mm. you know they really do ground it that way and you know there's no gadgets you know really in, in reality they have a tracking device that's it and but to me casino royale will always be a great i i at 13 years old ran to the theater with a backpack like three miles after school to go see it because I was so excited for it. And to, to this day, I still think, I think the it's called the African rundown on the soundtrack and on the scene description. That's the chase scene, obviously, in the beginning of the film mm -hmm. after the title card. I think it's one of the top 10 actions, like for me, top five action scenes of all time. I'm obsessed with that. I think it's the best mm -hmm. action scene in any James Bond movie, best in any Daniel Craig film. Like it is so gripping, it's so incredible the way it peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys and rises and scale to the top. And like, they really work all the way up to this top of this crane and it doesn't peak there. Like they work all the way down and, and it's just absolutely incredible. Like I'm obsessed with Casino Royale. Um, and that's not even talking about deeper sense, but just from an action perspective, all the action scenes are immaculately done. And again, it's, it's, it is almost <clears throat> talk about the reality of, of Bond in the Craig era. It's like you couldn't you couldn't imagine Roger Moore doing that, <laughs> you yeah. know. Um, Roger Moore is not gonna be able to climb up that crane. <laughs> yeah, um, even even at his first introduction of Bond. No, it's it's yeah, it's 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 Bond on steroids. It is Bond, super serious, um, but also it's it's Bond being aware of kind of who he is in a way. Do, do you think as in like whether that was intentional or not intentional that now now from from the get-go bond is basically he's kind of acknowledging that he's maybe not a good guy <laughs> you know he's mm -hmm. he's he's basically he is a kind of a gun for hire he is sure someone who is an assassin which which is the whole point of you know the, the books and the original incarnation of James Bond is basically mm -hmm. James Bond is an assassin who who is sent to go and kill someone you know um where you kind of in the earlier films he's just the good guy and the hero yeah. now he's basically it's almost kind of like he's not black or oh, white yeah. he's he's more complex you know no, I think that's a good point. Like, it's kind of like she says in the third movie, we work in the shadows and this movie sets that up where like his character is a shadowy person. Like mm -hmm. as much as he's like a spy and a secret spy in the other movies, I think you make a good point. Like if you ask those characters, like if you ask Roger Moore's James Bond, are you a good person? He'd be like, of course, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know what, is that Bane or Roger Moore? I don't know. But, yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> but uh, Roger um, Bane. You know, same, with, same, with, same, with, same with like Sean Connery and I think mm -hmm. even Pierce Brosnan, they'd have this, the sense even though it's like dilute like almost delusional sense we're like i'm a good person you see them like making this argument like steering around backwards to make this argument that they're a good guy where i think that daniel craig embraces and from the get-go would tell you i'm not a good person i'm not a good mm. guy i'm this mm. asshole i'm this and this is what i'm good at and this is why i do it or whatever like there's so there's that that raw trueness to it it's, it's, it's a human quality like it's really the first time that bonds a human character he's not a superhero yeah you know, and even though we go to see him like he's a superhero, his name's on the, you know, James Bond movie, but it's like, 
Actually, no, I was, you know, it, it almost embraced the fact that the movies aren't called James Bond. There's other titles, you know, he's just this character leading through us. He's a human figure um, guiding us through it. And I, and I think Casino Royale shows that, like, there's no excessive thing. Like, I think it's actually more Bondy than people think. People say it's not Bondy enough, but it's super Bondy. It still has all the beautiful women in the beautiful locations, but it's not an excess. You know, he only sleeps with um, Vesper, you know, in yeah. this film. Like, even the first girl, like, in the old films, he would have just slept with her to sleep with her. And in this mm. film, like it does everything we need the movie to do. Like we saw her <laughs> on a horse for, for God's sakes, right? Like in a bikini still. So like, we don't get, <laughs> like, it's still like, Hey, we're James Bond film. We get him coming out the water and they roll around and they kiss and they mm. have sexual banter. But then when the moment comes, he's already got his information. There's absolutely no reason for him to be there. And he leaves. And it's like, it seems like such a small thing, but just by doing that and capturing a real way, just, just gives it a sense of like yes we've we've moved on from that playfulness you know that cattiness so and i think that continues throughout even in like quantum of solace i mean he you know he sleeps with yes that girl who gets covered in oil but again it's more that's a fun cheeky way that there's nothing non-consensual about that it's just kind of like he's a fun suave guy and the other main girl in the movie who's been like has a history of being like raped and tortured and who's also like a co-person throughout the third act um mm -hmm. she i forget olivia I can never pronounce that uh, loud saying, but Black Widow and Oblivion mm -hmm. and all those films, um, you know, she, they don't have sex or do anything either. They have a thing. So I think the films have been pretty good about like moving forward in that way, but still being James Bond. And I think every film up to no time to die has like evolved what that is. And I think they're going with the mm -hmm. times, but I don't think you watch those early films and think he's being like, that's part of the character. Oh, this guy's just like, you know, the movies aren't fantasizing that aspect of it, I guess you yeah. could say. You know, yeah, it's, it's it's looking at it from the character perspective and not the audience perspective as much. Where I think the earlier films, and that's why they were popular, was like, what does the audience want to see? And that was always the question, like the audience's view. Yeah. You know, they're really thinking about sitting in a theater. Where this time it's really clear this whole series, they're looking at it from the perspective of the character. And that's a big shift, isn't it? As you said, it's a big shift because, um, yeah, you didn't really get that. Uh, there wasn't any effort to make that shift. But with the Craig films, it very much was was that that your the audience is now going along on Bond's journey, mm -hmm. not not the audience's journey and Bond's performing for them. Yeah, exactly. Um, one one interesting again, I've mentioned it to a friend, and just because I saw Casino Royale not that long ago again, um, and from a director's point of view, I'll be interested in, you, in your thoughts. That um, opening shot where the first girl, I can't remember the name, the very attractive, dark haired girl when she's on the horse mm -hmm. going down the beach apart from the fact that who who rides a horse down a beach you know when there's people on it you know that's dangerous right <laughs> but there was there was something about the way that shot was set up that i really didn't like because it, it makes it appear that the beach is really narrow do you, do you know what mm -hmm. i mean so when yeah. it, it kind of all felt that they're all crammed on a very 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 small bit and there's just yeah they've got like five or six people and the, this is a horse set and it didn't look big enough for me bear in mind it's a beach and it goes on for miles right sure um yeah i don't i don't know if i don't know if that bothered you i don't, I don't know why but it was only like the third or fourth i time know the shot you're talking about and yeah it's because they they established they don't establish the beach with like a big wide shot they like establish yeah. it she's like on a tight lens it's like compressed yeah. background she's on a horse and then it cuts i, I don't know why it bothered me so much but it, it, it did i think it might even be if i go back if i'm remembering the shot i actually think it might be slightly out of focus slightly fuzzy which is every, yeah. every few shots is like that in a movie especially when you show on film so i think it's mm. one of those shots that's actually kind of like never has a, a clear frame that if you were to pause it it's like everything's yeah. in focus because she's writing and bouncing every flame frame is going to have some point of blur point yeah 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 so but um, um that yeah that, that's the only real crit real criticism mm -hmm. i i have it but yeah i i really like back to the bondisms i would just want to say because people yeah. always say it's like not bondy like the music is so bondy you don't even hear the main theme till the very end which is so perfect right i'm bond yep. james bond that whole ending is and that's the first time you hear the film the, the main theme but before that you hear the music is super energetic. You have all the previous Bond themes. It hints it constantly. And even like, you know, the villain, Le Chief, like when he gets out of that car and it, he does the perfect like movie head turn where he like looks the other way and turns around. You hear that little like, oh, a jungle, like Bond riff come in. He's got a scarred eye. It's like, that is, how is that not a James Bond? That's yeah, he's James he, Bond he, he thing cries possible. blood. 
and yeah, yeah he, he, it's like it's perfect and it like somehow feels <laughs> real and natural and again before we move on too far i just want to say like i love that the opening is black and white like that was such a creative yeah. thing it sets the mood and it's a completely different style than the rest of the film because the rest of the film's super kinetic and super you know born if, if you will born-esque and then this 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 opening scene is a very studious spy film, like a, like a 60s, 70s spy thriller. And it's black and white. And it really makes you lean in and suck into the movie. Almost like it's shot like when the novels would have been written. You know, when the novels yeah. were written, there would have been black and white. So it's like kind of establishes yeah. this whole setup to the world. And when it does the turnaround shoot and it includes the, the big gun barrel, I mean, come on, fantastic. The, the, the first time I saw it after not having watched it for quite, you know, num number of years, um, when it was on TV, I completely forgot that the beginning is black and white. So I was watching it thinking, what's up with the color? Like, is there something wrong with my TV? Like, <laughs> I don't remember this being black and white. Then obviously I was like, oh, I know it was black and white. Um, you're right. And it's, and again, it, it's, per it's a perfectly opening because it's, it's, it's the establishing of, of now Craig is James Bond. And you're right. It, it, it does all of that thing. It's, 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 uh, it's a nod, nod and a wig a wink to classic spy films of, of the 50s and 60s and they're in the office and it's espionage and that's all that sort of stuff and it's also that like gritty no, no nonsense and this is like there's a gun here and like mm -hmm. one of us is going to get shot sort of thing you know? um so and it's very much again I've, I've had this conversation it's in many ways it feels like um batman begins yeah, hundred percent. In in the sense that they they nailed it with it's almost it's almost like a pre Bond film, isn't it? It's almost like this is Bond's origin story. Yeah, you know, because he's 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 young, and he's fresh faced, and he's energetic, and he's like he's just been given the double O. Yeah. No, I mean, he doesn't say Bond, James Bond to the end of the movie. You don't hear his <laughs> music till the end. You know, it's not till the end of the film that he truly is the James Bond we know. Yeah. So it it's yeah it's it's him getting his wings and and, and everything else. Um, and the the film also has an interesting structure. Like it's very top heavy action wise. Like the first fifty minutes or so, fifty four minutes is like action and setup and all about ellip, uh, ellipsis and just stopping the plane. And there's that whole great action set piece at the airport. And it's not till after you've had these two massive action set pieces that then you meet Vesper and then you really get the main plot of the film. I mean, you really don't even start the poker stuff till after an hour. And then it That's really true, takes yeah. its time. And then there's like a, then the movie almost ends. And it's like this really true fake out. And it's not like, you know, and it's funny, this has always grown on me as a kid. I remember I thought it was a little long, but now the more I watch it, the more I love it because it, there's no, it's not like a fake fake out where it's like one little moment and then like, she's bad. It's like, no, it feels like, oh, the, you know, they succeeded and they're just really, they're spending 15 minutes together and this is what they're doing. And they're wrapping things up and they're falling in love. Mm -hmm. And it really establishes you to believe how much Bond cares about her. Yeah. And you really buy how much Daniel Craig and James loves her. And then the betrayal hits and it's like, boom, James Bond again. And it, it's mm -hmm. great. And again, that reason at the end when he, you feel how hurt he is and you feel how much he loves, he's like holding her dead body, trying to like resuscitate her. And mm -hmm. then how angry he is after when he like calls her, um, you know, I don't know if you can cuss on the show, but you know, calls her whatever to M. So it's, a, it's just like, you feel the torn emotion. And I mean, you feel how that would create this, this guy who is James Bond, yeah. you know, this tortured soul who's afraid to connect and pushing people away and using all of his skill sets as a, mm -hmm. you know, deflection for people to get to really know him, you know, so. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, with such a strong start and reception, because, you know, it, I think it was, it was well reviewed and well liked, you know, mm -hmm. um, Quantum of Solace felt very misguided and very kind of lost, I think, both mm -hmm. as a concept. And I know, I know it was Craig's uh, least favorite of the Bond films. Um, he had said later later on. Um, yeah, what, what, what's your thoughts on, on that? Um, I think Quantum of Solace is an underrated movie. I think people exaggerate. Like you go on Bond things and people are like ranking it last and it's like, okay, calm down. Like the actual quality of filmmaking is is really good like oh it's yeah a, it's yeah no question like, you know yeah. what i'm saying like the cinematography is still fantastic the soundtrack's fantastic you go to amazing locations there's amazing yeah. things like it is a is, is a really well-made movie you know and yeah. and yes the editing is a little too choppy and as someone who's it's funny I, I, the more i watch it and someone who's edited features and stuff i i kind of have appreciated the editing more 
in it that it's trying to be different. It doesn't quite succeed, but they had a writer strike and he's trying to, so they didn't really have much plot as it's very obvious. That's the problem with the movie. It's like a Jason mm -hmm. Statham action movie. There's just no story of the string. It's just, it's really just a bunch of action set pieces strung together. Um, but because of that, it, I think it's fun. You know, it's very, it's the shortest Bond movie. It's like an hour and 41 minutes when the credits start. Yeah. So there's something about that where it's like, it's quick, it's watchable. And I think it's enjoyable for what it is. I just don't think there's any depth to it, but I think it's a fine like background James Bond movie. Mm -hmm. um, but what he does with the action, he, he tries to intercut all the scenes. Like in the first chase, it's intercutting with the, 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 like the horses or the bulls running and then like running around in Spain. And then like later on, it's intercutting with the opera, which I actually do think is a really good scene, the opera sequence I do really like. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's trying to do this like sense of kinetic energy and like the chaos isn't just what's going on, it's around, but it doesn't quite work. But I understand that with no plot, you know, he's trying to add depth to something yeah. when there's no depth there. So, you know, I, I, I feel for him because it is tough because on these movies, I've suddenly watched the making of these things like, you know, Anyone can make a good movie, anyone can make a bad movie, of course, and the script is important, but I mean, it's tough to know unless you're there. And Mark Forrest is a talented director, but like, if you've had to start shooting a $200 million movie and you really don't know what you're doing and you just have to show up to locations and be like, uh, I mean, that's hard. I mean, it's hard not to have preparation. I mean, imagine, I mean yeah. you can imagine the stress you have when you know exactly what you need to get and you have a time yeah. and you're like, we have to get these 12 shots done today. I mean, having to go in there and like not knowing what you need to get at all is a, is a very yeah, stressful point. Pointed at so, something. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But, but no, it's definitely a, a lack. I, I debate back and forth if I like that or Spectre more or less. I think they have opposite problems. I think that, um, you know, Quantum of Solace is like so stripped down, like too stripped down. It's almost not a bomb movie. It's just like this lean action movie, like 90 minute, like B action movie. And then mm -hmm. I think, Spectre is like long and lethargic. Like it has all the elements, but it's just like, it takes too long and every scene's a little slow. And it just, it's like, they're, they're like 40 minutes different in time and how long the movies are too. And it's like, what they're just like, op, they, I think they're equally good in a way, but just like complete opposite ends of the spectrum. So, that, you know, they're like, for me, they're still mid-tier Bond because they're really well-made movies, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, that, the filmmaker that, had to appreciate that, you know? Sure, that, that's the one thing, certainly with the, the Craig ones, because the continuity is, is much greater yeah. that there's no there's no badly made Craig mm -hmm. Bond you know that there'll be some that's more popular with fans than others some better story than no, others I mean, but yeah they're all some better movies yeah. of course but the the quality yeah. of the craft is still there sure um Skyfall which yeah probably is my favorite if not mm -hmm. Casino Royale um Again, I just I remember watching it at cinema, thinking, "Oh wow, you know that they've they've managed to go maybe maybe because of after Quantum and Solace, but I just remember thinking, wow, they've really pulled out all the stops yeah. here, you know." It, it's, oh, Skyfall is is a quintessential Bond movie, you know, pretty mm. much. Yeah, I mean, I I remember hearing my my brother in law shortly after it saying basically, "Yeah, it was the best Bond film he's ever seen," sort of thing. You know? mm -hmm. um, and it's it's interesting, isn't it? That there's there's lots of things that makes it very good, but in many respects, it's kind of almost like the least Bond film, in the fact that you know he he gets to go home to his sort of adopted childhood mm -hmm. place, and he's sort of defending his family home about the, from these people without gadgets and sure. lasers and everything else. And that's actually really non-Bond in, in many ways, you know? Sure. No, um, that was a non-Bond third act, I would agree. Yeah. My only flaw, this is not with Skyfall, but I guess with the whole series, we'll talk about this is like, so we, Quantum of Solace is a direct sequel to Casino Royale we didn't mention, which takes place yeah. basically right after. Sure. And then Skyfall is like, kind of does the whole like, he's maybe too old for this. He got shot, he has to come back angle which works for the movie but in hindsight because now the next ones are all direct sequels you go it's only missing one movie like all you needed was like one individual storyline that like after mm -hmm. quantum of solace that's like not attached to anything and if that existed then it would be like uh, like oh that makes because then you can time pass because now when you watch skyfall you have to assume like oh then there was a bunch of missions after quantum of solace yes now skyfall so it's like you know if there was just one it's easier to imagine oh that was one of a bunch but now you just have to completely imagine oh 
there was a six year gap because he was young and, and becoming Bond, and now he's like, yeah, uh, like if, if old. They, now it's like three movies of him getting old that was Bond. Yeah, if, if they if they could, if they could throw in a remake of Man with Golden Gun, oh, the right in the middle, right there, yeah, boom, exactly, yeah, 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 just one one off movie. Um, but I will say about Skyfall is like, um, it's just it's an impeccable filmmaking. In the beginning, I'm actually really obsessed with. It. I just want to talk about this opening prologue is. It, it's such a it's from a filmmaking perspective it's everything you want it to do from, um it starts out it's in the shadows right just like the theme of the movie and it's like bond coming down the corridor it's out of focus he comes up tight shot on the eyes and there's that down and that the whole theme and it's like it, it's what you want the movie's tight it's contained at lean and then what happens then it goes into a room and we expand into this room where we see um this other guy's passed out or like bleeding out the the hard drive's gone and you have Bond, which, so the room's expanding. So we already get that scope, just going from a hallway to a room, subtle. But then you, you, if you haven't seen a Bond film or you don't know what's going on, it tells you everything you need about his character in 30 seconds. Like he's there, the, looking for the mission, it's gone, but he tries to, to save this guy. He's putting pressure on him. They say, Bond, get after it. And he says, put, applying a pressure to so-and-so, when it, like, I'm gonna get it after I'm done with this. They tell him, no, leave him to die. You gotta go after it. And he has a moment there, where he looks at him, he gives remorse. I don't want to do this, but I have to do it. And that sums up everything you know about his character. We relate to him, we like him, we, we get why he has to go, but we see he cares, we see he's a real human. And that, that instantly tells, and then of course he walks outside and that scope again, that like three acts of just like hallway, room outside, boom. And you feel the breathness of like the movie expanding as you're watching it. Then you get into a car and it's like a light car chase that turns into a bigger car chase. Then it turns into a, a shootout, which turns into a motorcycle chase. And that motorcycle chase goes to a train fight. So it's like that, that, that classic expansion of like, we started in a hallway, we went to a room, we went outside, we went to a car chase, we went to a bike chase. It's like, it's the perfect like evolution of just expanding something. And it's that perfect little 12, 13 minute short film in the beginning. And it's also, I think one of the best jobs of uh, tying in the music like some songs feel like they're connected to the theme. Some songs feel like they're just a song. And this one, even the, the thematicness of the song, what the song actually sounds like, and then even the titles and how it leads in really just connects well. He goes into the water, it leads into the water there. It's like, it just feels hopefully thought out this movie and really like just perfectly executed. And uh, mm. um, yeah, no, big fan of Skyfall. Do you, do you think you just describing that beautifully about the ex expanding scenes expanding out from a very condensed location room design to something bigger do you think a lot of action films these days don't get that you know yeah. just to go off on for, for a second that um maybe not just these days maybe always but you know um i'm thinking of you know transformers for example mm -hmm. like they they don't ever seem to get the the progression. It's it's here. Then oh shit, we're on a massive planet and there's explosions yeah. and there's a thousand things coming out. You know, um, and yeah, there's something to be said with um, yeah. No, so. I think that's a major problem. It's something I always talk about. I'm gonna go on a little tiny rant here, I guess. But like, yeah, yeah, Jurassic Park's my favorite movie, mm. and I always talk about this. And this is. I've said this for years. I'm going to say this again. And I'm, tomorrow, if, or 10 years from now, if you gave me a meeting at Universal Studios, I, I would say the same thing probably. Um, you know, when you watch Jurassic Park, one was so great, Spielberg, he holds the camera like he, he, in a sense of patience where he doesn't give you a money shot until you need it, you know? So if you actually watch that film, uh, 18 minutes in is when they arrive at the island and you get that beautiful, majestic pull-up shot and the John Williams music, bum, 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 bum. It's mm -hmm. so grand. And it's like, every movie has that that point in story where you're going to a new location, a new a castle, a hidden world, and you have that reveal. But Jurassic Park's got one of the most sentimental, like, or since uh, uh, crucial, key, uh, famous ones in history. When you pull up to an island, it's like, why does it have that effect? And it's because the whole time leading up to that, he doesn't try to wow you. If you actually watch that movie, the, the, um, the only shot really above like the shoulder until you get there is like the third shot of the film. It starts out it's like trees rustling. There's a guy waiting for the raptor to come through the thing. Mm -hmm. And it says like Isla Nublar, 120 miles of coast to Costa Rica. And you start low and you kind of pan and you see the thing getting lifted into the crate. But it's not too big of a, of a set. You're not going too high. It just kind of sets yeah. up there. Then you don't see the raptor. You see, shoot her, shoot her. And the whole tense sequence. And the scene ends with like a hand getting slipped. And it fades. There's no big stab, like crazy wide shots. And then it cuts to like you're low and it's the water and it's the lawyer getting pulled on the thing. But again, you're like briefcase level. You're the level of a shin. 
and you pan with him all the way across the rocks. And yes, there's extras in the background, the waterfall, but like you're low with him and you're contained. And then you go into the, the Grant's a digger like me scene and he's chipping at the mosquito. And it's like, those are tight, intense shots. And it cuts from there in a contained space to the close up of brushing off the fossil. And it keeps a very contained scene with the raptors and the fossil brushing out. In. And then it goes to, you learn about Jurassic Park inside of a small little tube like this metal container, like, you know, mobile home. It's like the least scientifically advanced place ever. And that's where you learn about this scientific place. I'm almost done, sorry. Then you go to Costa Rica and there's no establishing shot of Costa Rica. It's just a guy getting out of a car. You follow the briefcase. He walks till he sits down at the restaurant. That's when he has the whole scene where you're like, we got dots in here. And they shows him yeah. the little the, the, the shaving cream stuff. And then you go finally to the helicopter. And you see an established shot of the helicopter, which is above it. And it's like, okay, but it's just helicopter over water then you're contained in there and then you pull up and it wows you. And it's like, well, why does that work? And it's because it held off. At any point in time, if you had gone to Montana and showed an establishing shot of Montana and the rolling hills of Montana and look how wide and vast Montana is at any point in time, well then pulling up to Jurassic Park and seeing the rolling hills of Jurassic Park doesn't have any effect or meaning or yeah, in the same yeah. way. And the same thing about learning about Jurassic Park. We didn't have shots of a science laboratory. We didn't get an establishing shot of buildings or a city. We didn't see anything yeah. highly technology. We were just there in a mobile <coughs> And then when we go to Jurassic Park, now it feels even more advanced because we haven't shown that. Compare that to like the Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, which, you know, talented people involved, don't want to say anything negative, but every single scene transition in that movie is massive. Chris Pratt is building a house on a lake and it's like a giant helicopter yep. shot sweeping around trees, the sun setting. Then there's a shot of like a, of a, of a house and it's before, a mansion before we even get to the island. It's a giant helicopter shot pulling up and the Jurassic Park music playing, even though we're not on the island yet, it doesn't make any sense. Then 22 minutes in, when we get to the island, you have no emotion. It's like, well, it's because it's the fifth movie. It's like, no, no, it's not because it's the fifth movie. It's because you haven't given me anything to emote to because you've wasted it. And not to get going on the rant slightly, my other complaint about Man of Steel slightly, and I, don't be wrong, love Zack Snyder, love all the type of films, look up to all these people. But when you watch Man of Steel, they have a 20 minute action set piece of just on, on the whole planet's blowing up on Krypton. And there's, he's flying a dragon. He's like, ah! And it's like the most biggest, craziest, expensive looking thing I've ever seen. Like the world. And then it's like, wow. And then it cuts back to Earth. And then he's Superman is saving an oil rig, and oil rig's blowing up. And I've never seen any human being lift so much. And he's doing the craziest thing. Then that's 25 minutes in. Then, you know, 20, 15 minutes later, he's like putting on a suit and flying. And it's like, why do I not have the same emotion? And it's like, yeah, because I already saw a dragon flying. Yeah. I saw him saving all this stuff. There's no buildup. There's no thought process kind of into like, how do we keep the scope building and building? And then before back in the day in movies, they used to have to do this because they couldn't afford all the effects. They couldn't do anything. This yeah. ability to do anything and everything whenever you want has really tricked people into thinking that it's showing the coolest thing is the best thing. That's not true at all. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, it <laughs> It's no, no, it's, it's a very, 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 very insightful and very, very good point. It's because the shark wouldn't work, isn't it? It's because Spielberg learned that from Jaws because they, the damn thing wouldn't work. So mm -hmm. you couldn't, couldn't show it early on in the film, yeah? Um, and it's, I, I've said this to quite a few people. It's my, my not that I'm a filmmaker one day, maybe, who knows? Um, my gripe with low budget sci-fi or horror films mm -hmm. when they they don't have the budget or perhaps the expertise to do the effects, but yet they insist on showing the effects at mm -hmm. every given opportunity. And it's like, don't, because they're going to suck. They're yeah. not going to look good, you know? Like there's this werewolf uh, film... Um, on a on a train and these werewolves they're like attacking the passengers and it's just like sounds like something i'd watch <laughs> yeah i mean I'm, I'm trying to i'm trying to remember what it's called I, the thing i think it's a british show it's not, it's not a bad it's quite enjoyable but it would have been so much better if they didn't show all of the werewolf standing yeah. there attacking passengers because it's all cgi and it's all really quite sure rubbish cgi <laughs> yeah you know that if it, they showed a bit of that or just the person being attacked, you don't know what's attacking them and hold off to the much later on with the werewolf, then you could have spent more time and effort and it would have had more of an impact. Like, yeah, if you show the baddie in the opening scene, hey, this is what I look like. And it's like, yeah. like forget but it. Even for a low budget movie like that, you think it's like if you got cut half the shots where you see all the werewolves and you, you could spend the same amount of money on half those shots and make them look twice as good. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's, that's exactly my point. Uh, yeah, I, I 
don't get it but hey they made a film and i have um but yeah back back to bond um yeah i yeah i think i th i think skyfall just sort of blew everyone away and um yeah it's interesting how it's a Spectre, it did feel a little bit too long after that. Mm -hmm. It did feel a little bit um, clunkier. Um, still, still great, great film. Um, uh, I don't know. I suppose at that point now we're kind of we're familiar with Craig's mm -hmm. bonds, aren't we? A little bit more and and how he is and what we kind of expect. So maybe we're a little bit more um laid back and a little bit like well yeah impressive sort of thing you know i like i like the concept of specter and again i think it's a super well-made movie it's beautiful to look at a lot of real mm -hmm. stuff i just think two things really kind of bog the movie down it is a little lethargic i think some of the editing is a little slower pace and like like the car chase and things that are really cool should or should be cooler and there's just, there's just a the, the, not a sense of energy or rhythm to it quite as much but i mean the filmmaking on the day-to-day -day is just as good but the plot stuff is slightly wonky like him being related to blofeld that maybe does feel like a step too much yeah but it's like but maybe there's just one of them is too many because there's also like he's trying to connect all the films together which i think maybe is a bit and maybe if you don't do that and you just make blofeld the brother then the, the brother line could work better but it mm -hmm. feels like there's just one too many things they're trying to make like all connect and gel together and that and i also just like the other subplot for me i just my thing i don't like most about the movie is not even that stuff it's just the I love Ralph, uh, Rafe, Ray Fiennes, and I love, yeah. um, you know, Ben Warshaw and everybody in, in involved on that team, but they all, they give him too much to do, I feel like, in Skyfall almost, where that, like, every, I mean, not Skyfall, it's Spectre, like, the subplot of them getting C, I, I don't know, I don't like C, he's great in uh, Fleabag, but the moment he shows up on screen, it's like, we just now established a new M, like, the first scene with the new M, it's like, hey, meet this other guy and you're like oh so that's mm -hmm. the villain working for Blo like literally the first time you see it you're like so that's the villain working for blofeld and it's yeah. like that's end up what happened and they try to make it a big reveal at the end it's like yeah we, we know so it, it yeah we're, we're, we're ahead of you yeah, yeah yeah but it is still an entertaining movie and it's still james bond i still like, like the mexico opening is really cool I mean, yeah it's it's again a gorgeous film to look at like be so beautifully shot it's christopher nolan cinematographer hote they i can't never pronounce his name i can't pronounce anyone's name so i should mm. just not even try yeah me, me neither but um yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, cert certainly not a bad, bad film in any way. Um, and again, um, felt like a long, long gap, not just because of COVID and the delay of, of releasing No Time to Die, but it kind of, it was in, it's interesting, the evolution, both in cinematic universe, but in reality as well. It, it kind of did feel certainly from like, Skyfall onwards, that Daniel Craig kept, after every Bond film that came out, he kind of almost kept distancing himself publicly from Bond, as in like, oh, I don't want to do another one, I'm done with it now, I'm not going to make another one, and then making another one, whether that was a kind of a ploy for like, give me a little bit more money, or or whether that's part of their plan, because mm -hmm. you're never quite sure. And um, yeah, it kind of kind of felt it was time, but I agree with you that it, it kind of misses one other standalone film pre that. Um, but yeah, we're we're here now, and after all the delays. <laughs> Yeah, we 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 made it both both to the end of this. Yeah, and, um, we're yeah we're 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 fifty years into a franchise, and twenty five films into something that's it's yeah never never really been been matched, um, maybe never will again, and it's why why does it still work? you think the, the um, on films and the concepts and i think as we talked about earlier it's like it's the same but different and i think it's that you know sense of being able to reestablish something and also i think it's the storytelling is the same you know i'm one of those people who believe you hear it like all stories whether someone writes an article that says you know or all stories are the same or there's nine different stories or ten different stories or two i like agree with all those things i really think that 
storytelling is simple and there's not that many different things. It's how you tell it, it's interpretations, it's retelling of things. You know, we've been doing this for thousands of years and, you know, they're always, you know, we're humans, we're interacting. We have, you know, you, it is what it is. And even as a writer, I feel like people like to act like there's infinite places to go and there is, but I always think there's only three places to go in a way, right? Cause you can go, you can take the A route or the B route or you can flip around and do something else. But by flipping around and doing something else, even if that's anything, you're making that decision to do something else, like to subvert. So it's like, you could always find something like, you know, there's nothing quite original. And I was thinking about today, I'm like, wow, there's, you know, 25 James Bond movies now. We have how many Bourne movies? There's 10 Fast and the Furious movies. You know, they got Mission Impossible nonstop. You know, how many superhero movies? And it's like, you know, it's funny, you think you, you wouldn't get into it, but the way the medium is set up, you, you, you turn on a story and you just get sucked in. And it doesn't matter, you know, if it's good, it's good. It doesn't matter if it's similar or not similar. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's it stayed because it's generational. I think that's the thing that some franchises don't have. They yeah. just like, it was a hit for time. It was a hit for a certain group of people. And it was a good film that some people saw, but James Bond, every single generation of people have a connection to it. Even if they don't see the films. You know, there's like a version yeah. of that, which they expect and they have their own interpretation. But like, because the films came out so often, there's no matter what age you are, there's, there's people that age that also relate to it, right? There's there, you could be born in a time period where you weren't getting at least a Superman movie. So you could see how maybe yeah. Superman was your favorite character because there was no Superman movies in the nineties, mm -hmm. right? And if you grew up at that time, you never saw Superman on screen, but you know, you saw James Bond on screen in every single decade of time. And it's been, and again, it's not just about that. It's the consistency of quality. Like that was so hard. It's not like they had four or five films in a row that are terrible. The box office mm -hmm. go down. They've, mm -hmm. There's been ebbs and flows of anything, but they've been consistent. And, and that also goes into the effort of produ producing because a lot of franchises you'll see, they cut corners or this one makes less or they do that. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. they are they are truly giving it their all every single time. And I, and yeah, I think or, or like, 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 I'm actually nervous now because they sold it. Like I'm, I'm scared that now it could, it could see differences because now you have a corporate head yeah. That's going to need something. It's like Star Wars. It's like, we're going to get a James Bond TV show. I mean, what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. James, James Bond, another planet, a comedy, James Bond <laughs> telling jokes like that. What that's... if it was James Bond, but he worked at a grocery store? Yeah, it's like a yeah, comedy yeah, show. Yeah. Like you're going to get all those pictures. Yeah. I, I, he could talk to animals. Or, <laughs> like, it's like yeah. Dr. Doolittle. It's James Bond. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's. What if he wore a suit? that was like made of iron and it shot gadgets yeah, and could, from and it and he could fly, fly around yeah. and then go to space and fight aliens. Yeah, like, yeah, like, like he, he was involved in some sort of like atomic <sighs> meltdown. He had superpowers. Um, yeah. yeah, let's hope they don't have any of these meetings. Um, <laughs> it, again, my same, same friend that I have been speaking to a lot about this friend, he he mentioned. Uh, have you seen the film? Um, was it the the History Boys? Um, uh -huh. It came out quite a long time ago. And again, I I don't know. Do you, I don't know in America? Did you ever get or aware of like the whole Carry On films? Mm -mm. Like, I don't think the British, so. British films from the sixteen seventies, Carry On movies. Like, oh, I've never uh, heard that term, but like there, the, there's. I feel like there's a large flex of. Um... Like 60s, 70s British film, but it's only no, like like Carry On Camping or character. Anyway, the the whole point was mentioned in this this other film, The History Boys, um, where basically the Carry On films were like um, really low budget kind of, a little bit like Benny Hill sort of thing, like there were comedies mm -hmm. made in the early 60s that weren't very good and okay. made for the British audience and. Um, run, running gag and just innuendo and all that sort of stuff and yeah there was nothing particularly cinematic or great writing or anything about it but the, in this film which is an Alan Bennett uh, written uh, film they made the point of sometimes something becomes like an iconic piece of um, art or literature just by persisting that if you make enough of it that it becomes important, you know, even if sure. it didn't start out to be that important, you know, like, you know, like kind of like the Fast and Furious films, you know, they, if they keep sure. making, if they make another 10 films. I don't know about that. Then, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I have no idea. I hear what you're saying, sorry. Just but you know what I mean? It's just, it's just by the fact that, or even say The Simpsons, not that I'm saying The Simpsons is bad, I, I, I love The Simpsons, but again, The Simpsons, by, by 
the sheer fact that it's been on TV for as long as it has mm-hmm. is important. You know, yeah. it, the body of work is more important than each part. Um, so it's almost like the Bond thing, the universe, even though we've kind of talked about and said there isn't particularly a bad film, there's some better than others, but none of them were like that just plain suck. But it's because it's been around for so long that it's almost, it can't not be around now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Even, even if it sort of stopped for a, a little bit, I think that there would be a demand for it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think if maybe five years went past and they didn't find another Bond, I think someone somewhere would be like, hey, we need Bond back, you know? Oh, I'm sure people are already, like if it was up to the studio, I'm sure they want Bond every year, but that's how you kill it. I think yeah. I think they're going to keep going with Bond. I think you let it sit for a little bit. You know, I don't, I personally don't need another Bond film for six years. I mean, I'd be mm-hmm. okay with it. I just waited six years for the last cap, right? So sure. I think, you know, if one by the end of the decade, it's fine. Yeah. And I think from then on out, it's similar with what Star Wars should have kept doing where, yeah, you know, it's, not, it's a different time period. We shouldn't get a movie every two years for time. I think that's gonna, that would actually overkill something now. And I get yep. today's culture, yep. things are there and gone. But I, I definitely think keeping something away and re-releasing it, it, it and having that like, oh, yeah, I feel fresh again is always great. So, you know, I think we should they should wait six, seven years, have a new bond, make five movies. And then mm-hmm. again, take eight years have, off, 10 have years a break. off. Yeah. Wait. For, I mean, that's what I would do with most franchises like Star Wars. I think that was my problem with the Star Wars movies now is not just the idea of it. Like we, they need, they stopped it, but making a movie every year, which was unnecessary. When in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, so far they made six movies in the course of like 35 years and it's still the most popular franchise. Mm-hmm. So it's like, why do you need to make five movies in five years? There's a certain point where it's like they could have just made three movies. Yep. And like with gaps, been the most popular movies, when, good or bad, the people would have loved them. There's only three of them. Then you wait 15 years. And I know it sucks because you're not making all that money. But if you wait yep. 15 years and do it again, it's going to be, it's going to confirm for history of life. The next 50 years, Star Wars will be the biggest franchise in the world. It, but by doing it so quickly, it's now just another franchise. Like it's a big franchise, yeah. but there's a world 20 years from now where if they make 10 more Star Wars movies, where my grandkids, Star Wars is just like anything else. When it's like, it could have still been the thing that every 15 years, everyone goes, oh my God, I can't believe they're making more of them. That's that's the problem with having someone who runs a theme park makes films, you know, yeah. because <laughs> they're open every fucking day, you know? No, it's so funny, real quick, sorry, going back, Avengers Campus out here at California Adventure, they just built this little Avengers land. It's not even that great. It's like a tiny little land. They got a little Spider-Man ride. It's the same ride. They already have a, this is a different theme in the park. It's a, it's, it's a cool little land, but it's all about character meet and greets. But they were doing a thing where they were advertising. Every week, Loki was in a new outfit based off the Loki show that you can come take pictures with. And every week there was like a new drink with a different fruit themed to the different drink. It's like, it's all just designed for those people to be like, oh my God. I went, you see people every week. I got to get a picture with Loki in a different costume. First of all, it's not yeah. some guy dressed as Loki. I don't know why you got it, but whatever. Sure. But people are desperate. They got to get the new drink. They got to get that new picture with Loki. Yeah. They want that new piece of merchandise. So it's just, uh, it's just feeding that machine. It's no longer. Yeah. It's a machine. Yeah. Yeah. It and again, movies were always big spectacle and always block and you're always making them mm-hmm. for money. And I get that. That's a, it's a commercial thing. It's what I do, but that's not why you do it you know you're trying to make the best movie you're trying to tell the best story and you don't want to overkill somebody does, but like you want to make money while you do something right you don't necessarily want to so but that's not you know you, i don't know it's like you own a shop and you like carve wood like i'm sure you wanted to like get money for your carving so what you deserve mm-hmm. but you don't want to just like no longer have a say in anything and it becomes just yeah. this like thing everywhere it's like i don't know it just it's it's lost it's kind of touch yeah, absolutely i mean and we've probably already touched upon it, but we'll kind of we'll wrap up. But I, I suppose, I, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in to sort of, from an American point of view of, what do you think James Bond says about Britain? If, if, if anything, the fact that it's a British character, because again, I think Britain does have a kind of, quite a odd, um, relationship with James Bond um you know that back in the I don't know if you remember the 2020 2012 Olympics opening mm-hmm. scene yeah, when yeah. it was in London again that was a, there was a Bond Craig Craig did a thing with the Queen there and it like Danny Boyle obviously directed that so they made yeah. it like a Bond sort of thing and again it's like you know they referenced Bond 
even though there's loads of British films, but they didn't mention that it was Bond because it's kind of Bond is this quintessential British character. It's um, what what does America kind of think, or, or do do they pay that much of close attention? As in, like this is mm -hmm. some sort of projection of of like Lost Empire or something. Or yeah, I don't know if people in America think about that. You know, I think I thought about that stuff watching the older films and thinking about that perspective of like. Is it a last hoorah for like, you know, cause like, you know, it used to be this big empire and now it's shrinking and these, these movies are travelogues and showing that they're still policing the world and doing mm -hmm. stuff. But like, you know, I just thought of it as like a movie, you know, growing up as a kid, American movies. And I guess this is America. We do try to police the world and the results, but like, you know, mm -hmm. it's always America in the movies. And it's like, well, those are British movies. So it's always British. And it's like, we're always, they're always like teaming up with America and doing yeah. stuff. And we've always been allies. So I've always, I've always looked at it as like, the British, it's like a perspective for me is like, okay, so this is the head of the allies thing. Like the MI6 is the highest form. It's like, it's, it's above, you know, the, the CIA, FBI, all that stuff is too big, too bureaucratic. And like the MI6 is kind of like the top. That's what like the movies present. But from mm -hmm. an empire perspective, it's interesting. I don't think people really think about that way. I think to us, it's just, it's a movie franchise. Mm -hmm. um, but I've definitely heard other people comment on this and talk about it because it's like, you're visiting places that you know places you used to have you know demand or command yeah. over and you're yeah, dealing yeah. with subjects of you know power and all the, and, and but it's, it's not something i think we think about here but I, mm. I think it's just an import but the one thing i'll say what i see about james bond and what i kind of what i like about it and this is maybe as a californian as an american i don't have that same connection america's such a big place yeah um, that I don't know if I have a sense of communalism that people have in other countries. And I feel like even, you know, uh, England, which I feel like I have a little bit of like, I don't know, I feel like I, I, I feel like if I was from England, I would have more pride in like my country and my heritage and stuff just in a way, because like, I, I don't know, like, for example, like, you know, the World Cup not, or like not, or the Olympics, like as an American, I don't feel like I need to root for America all the time. I just want to root for like, I usually want to root for the smaller country, the people who deserve it the most. Like, sure. it's just like, I don't, like, but I feel like if I lived in group in England, I'd be like, no, like we're, you know what I'm saying? Like this is a, and I don't know if we fully have that here, which, so I feel like when I watch that, yeah. it, it feels sweet. Cause I feel when I watch James Bond, I do feel an extra sense of love into it because I do feel like it's your guys's thing. And there's something about that, that I don't know if it makes it a little slight extra tint of magic. And I don't know if it's something American that we fantasize about British stuff. Like I like Harry Potter. And we like that. Like we somehow like our roots are actually ingrained there. And I don't mm. know if that's somehow an extra thing of like, it's this smaller, cool place we used to go and everyone was together. And like we, it, you know, I don't know if there's this, it's hard. I've never really thought about that. I've never been asked that question. I've never, I've never even thought about James Bond in that capacity, honestly, until recently, until the new film mm. was really coming out. I started just thinking about it and talking about it. Um, Cause I think to us, it's just another spy movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's more or less. And I think that Americans see themselves as an extension of British. Like, so like, I think the way Americans look at like the UK is like, you guys are our little brother, even though you guys are our older brother, you're like our best buds. Like if there's, we're going to a fight, we'd be like, yo, what's up? You know, you got you speaking sure. English. Like, like, like that's essentially like, that's really what it is. Like, so it's like, I yeah, just yeah. feel like there was, that America has always just taken that as like, oh, it's we're basically just watching us, but like across the pond. Yeah, like, you know, but, it's like America yeah. too. Like, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I, I know what you mean. But it's uh, like the cuter, smaller town America that we're all like, oh, one day we'll go visit that small town America. Yeah, we're, we're yeah. Based just, we built this big city based off that little town we're all from. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They just drink tea instead of coffee and all that sort. Of, yeah, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, no, again, I, th I thought it'd just be interesting um, to ask because, yeah, certainly in the UK there was a lot of articles and a lot of talking about it but i think maybe some of these people are taking it too seriously and mm. reading into it a little bit more than it needs to be because it is a fictional character based on some yeah. books and they are films you know um very, very last bit before we go because we've been talking for, for we didn't even talk about no time to die that much um i mean that that's true well that's why i kind of wanted to mention this you know we have been talking about 50 years worth of filmmaking um what, what was your thought? Because again, I, I had some mix, mixed feelings with, because again, for, for a long time before the film came out, the whole kind of, um, oh, 007 is now a black woman. 
yeah. and then you, you you find out um that in the film because james bond has re- walked away yeah. and he's retired and obviously the 007 has now been given to someone else who happens to be uh, a black woman um I kind of think it was a wrong move for them to give the 007 back to Bond because they had already kind of established that it's like, yeah, it's ju- it's just it's just a number and you're yeah. doing your 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 job and it doesn't stop me doing my job. And but but they kind of give it back and it's kind yeah. of almost like all that work done to that point kind of was undone when they said, oh, you almost like you deserve it more sort of thing. Yeah. What, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. No, I agree. Like it's, it's weird to talk about the movie, but I remember like specifically when that moment happened. I was like, it's kind of unnecessary. Like at no point in the movie, like was I questioning. Like you know, they explain it. It's there. Like she's double seven. They make fun little gags of it. Like I wasn't thinking. Like wow, they better resolve that. I really hope he becomes 007 again. Like, yeah. You know, like he can't know kill people. Last movie. He's got the license. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just seemed like it was. But they used it as a way to give her an arc. See, I always look at it from a filmmaker. I can look at it. I agree with that statement. I agree, but I sometimes look at it the practical way. Is like they're there. They got to figure it out. Something's not working. They're like, listen, we got to give more of an arc. You know, we didn't establish something. It's like just by making her say that. People like, oh, that completes her story arc. That now she likes likes to work with them, and it's clear versus later in the movie. Um, but again, I, I I didn't think it was necessary. And it's like, first of all, also who cares? People people those are just the smallest percentage of people online who get mad about that stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, no one cares. I mean, it's it's a James Bond movie. It's Daniel Craig, not the lead. Like if I show, listen, if I went to the movie theater and the movie's not about Daniel Craig, it's about her being 007 for 70, for 90% of the movie. Yeah, be, I'd be angry, this is bullshit, but it's not, okay, it's, it's a Daniel Craig, James Bond movie. He's still James Bond, you know, she, and it, it makes logical sense for the story. I mean, he literally retired in the last film. Like she also does a great job. Like, yeah. you know, I think she, I think that's actually one of the better parts of the movie is that banter and that fun that they have and that chemistry. And personally also, they use her. It's funny. They, like, it's just a code name because they actually use her like any other Bond girl. Like she's basically like, an, like you know, like and uh, what I mean that is like the Bond girl who helps in the third act. Like a lot of movies have that from Rush, uh, not from, um, Spy Who Loved Me or, you know, Tomorrow Never Dies. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of movies where like Bond, you know, picks up someone on the journey and they both have a mission and they're both there to do something at the third act. And that's what happens there. The only difference is she also works for her government. I mean, his government instead of someone yeah. else's like, so that was a completely weird thing that people got upset about for no reason. The, the thing that I kind of forgot about until just now, but I was really impressed with, and I can't remember her name. The the other uh, early on when <laughs> when they go to uh, oh uh, Anna Anna the I can never pronounce her name either. I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. She she's fantastic. Great. Her her character was brilliant in it. She does a fantastic job um and i'm she brought so much energy to the film when it needed it it needed a fun presence she should have been in it way more i think yeah. i think she exited the film too early too quickly. I think yeah could have come back um yeah i thought i thought she was brilliant i thought that yeah you're right the energy that she injected into that and just the, the fun of it the kind of like this is my first mission sort of thing um, what did you think of uh, the villain in the movie um Ramek Melik. uh I think I could have done more with him. I kind of felt, I, I don't know if I like the idea that he was the person from years before. Yeah, it's weird when you think about it. I was like, how old was he? Because he looks pretty <laughs> yeah, young still. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Like, you look exactly the same. What, what was he, 12 then? Uh, and, like, she was a child and now she looks like a Yeah, like woman, she's yeah. aged, but like he's been in the snow or something and he's not aged. That didn't make sense. Um, he, he, he almost kind of, almost like you, you feel a bit sorry for him, and he's, just, he's not. He's not like a um, a sinister sort of person, particularly more just like a tragic figure, but but not in a threatening way. Sure. Um, um, I I don't know. I, I yeah, as as Bond villains go, I don't think he's one of the better ones. Yeah, um, I mean, I like that he has a layer, and it has the right idea, but. Not menacing enough. I agree. Yeah, I, I and again, which ties I think, into the ending, which I don't was that's the main thing we want to talk about, right? Is like what? How did you feel about that whole, you know, what they chose to do, and killing James Bond? Spoilers for this three-hour podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Well, I, I don't know. It's almost, I read somewhere else, which I don't know if I believe that basically when Craig came on board in um, Casino Royale, that he wanted the James Bond character to be killed in the, whatever last film he made, which mm -hmm. I kind of find it hard to believe because I don't think they would have given him at that point that I much. I think it's something he came up with later. Yeah. Yeah. But the, pro the problem is I don't know if anyone believes it because everyone, because they know now how Bond works. Everyone would be like, yeah. but yeah, but he's going to come back anyway because the next guy will be James Bond. So they, I don't know if anyone really believes that Oh, he, he's dead. I mean, that nuke, I mean, those missiles hit him. I mean, I think they made it pretty clear, you know, that no, he's dead. No, yeah. he's dead in that, but they kind of know that there's going to be... The character. Like, there's going to be more movies, yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of almost like, well... They're going to have to reboot it again, everybody. Everyone's going to get... It's going to be a clean reboot. See, that's what I'm guessing. And obviously that's become over the last 15 years like a thing where, you know, we, we reboot and, and do a period of time. But will that kind of almost like fuck up the whole Bond-esque sort of thing? Because Connery to Moore to Timothy Dalton to Pierce Brosnan, they never needed a reboot. Yeah, each first film is kind of a, a low, sure. yeah, low yeah. reboot. And but the difference I'll, is they kill them. So like, if you, unless it's like you're saying, unless it's not the James Bond character, they kind of have to, mm, right? That's his name. Because this film, these films made it very clear that James Bond isn't a code name or anything like. Yeah, James yeah, Bond yeah. Is his name, you know? Well, that, that's the other thing, again, is like, which I didn't know until recently someone else, again, my friend Fran said that, oh, there was a theory that James Bond is actually a code name, that James yeah. Bond isn't James Bond. And it's just a, the name he codes with the 007, which I had heard of before. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be tricky. It's going to be interesting to see what they do. Um, but yes, they're going to have to reboot it, aren't they? But does that mean you're you're always constantly going back to almost well, like Casino Royale? You know, um, I don't think this time they would like. I, I think now it's if I would do it, just clean reboot it and pretend it's like you know Pierce Brosnan. Like I would just make a new Bond movie. I wouldn't do any sort of origin. I would just open yeah. with the big bombastic action set piece, like like Skyfall. Yeah. Like imagine the yeah. Skyfall opening. But it's a new yeah. actor. You wouldn't care. Yeah. You just you're, you're in the movie theater. All Absolutely. of a sudden, yeah, you have a guy. You're you're in the adventure. You're watching him, and by the end of the prologue, you're like, "That's the guy I'm following." He doesn't have to get <laughs> shot. You know, imagine if he wins at the end of the Spectre fight, and then like the yeah. music happens, you'd be like, "Oh, that's that's the yeah. hero," and you're already yeah, yeah. sold on it. And then from yeah. there on out, depending on how the series would go, maybe I would just do what I used to do and like maybe switch out an actor, maybe do this. Depends how it all runs its course. But would, um, would... I think it's definitely got to be a reboot. Again, I've heard Quentin Tarantino say that he would love to be invited to do a Bond, but he would want to do it in like a um, 60s or something. Yeah, like in, yeah. in, in, the, in a past, in a sort of a period. Uh, like piece. a one-off movie. Yeah, um, which I think could be interesting, whether it yeah. Tarantino attached or not. I think in a way, maybe going back to the 60s and doing a Bond in the 60s or 70s would be interest or even before that, say 50s mm -hmm. like cold war and all sort of thing but then again i think the way they would do it i think they would bottle it and mishandle it and i think yeah. they would try to do like a woke 1960s type thing also and it's I, hard to, to and also scale wise like without doing a lot of cg and making things look yeah. different it's hard to give it that same scope i feel like in that in that time period than you would be in mm -hmm. modern times yeah, so it would be interesting, or or if they want to, which again I don't think they should do, but almost like a young Bond, yeah, Bond Bond yeah. at university. Um, no, stop. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, that's I what I'm scared of. You know, no one, I don't think anyone wants to see like Bond in the Naval Academy, the Bond yeah. Chronicles, seasons yeah. one through twelve, now available. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Bond Young Adventures of Indiana like, Jones. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so I don't, I don't know. It will be interesting. I, I would like them to take their time before they announce it. I don't think they should announce it this year. No, I think they, they, should, should... they should let it sit. I mean, you, the movie yeah. just came out. Let it sit. Let it come out on Blu-ray. Let it gestate exactly. for a year. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I th yeah, I think they should not be in any rush to do it. But yeah. unfortunately, I think that the way things are and Star Wars and, and everything else... Mm -hmm. I think that everything's sped up and everyone's got to, oh, we've got to do it now. Yeah. Like if, you, if you're if you not releasing something every 18 months, like 
yeah. something's wrong. I mean, I think what's interesting is actually Michael G. Wilson is like 80 something and it made it seem like, and he gave a speech at the end of the premiere and other stuff, like seems like he's going to be stepping away from actively mm -hmm. producing the films, mm -hmm. which would leave just Barbara from the, you yeah. know, herself and she doesn't have any kids. Yeah, and she's still getting up there. She's in her late sixties, I think, or mid. 60s. Yeah, yeah, she's not young. Yeah. So, and I was looking at it. So it's like I guess Michael G. Wilson has a son who's an associate producer on some movies and does some other stuff. I wonder if he's going to take over, but um, you know, I wonder who's going to steer the ship forward from here. You know, it's interesting. And con continuity is important, you know, um, because yeah, you don't you don't want someone coming on with new radical ideas for one film, you know. Um, no, you want someone who cares about the whole thing. And that's what's also yeah. different. Sorry, it was like, you know, the only movies they produce are the Bond movies. Yeah. So there's a sense of like pride and care to it. I mean, getting a guy who's like, I produce 100 movies and now Bond's going to be 101. Yeah. There's a yeah, no matter what, there's a different level of passion that comes from that. You know, her family it, has been doing this for years. That didn't, that didn't work out for Star Trek, did it? No, um, I guess not. You know, um, yeah it's it's gonna be an interesting time and i i hope i hope for the sake of the longevity of the fact that it's been around 50 years i hope that whoever comes in understands the gravitas of of what they've got and gives it the attention it deserves rather than any say like a, a gun for hire like yeah i'm doing yeah. this one but i'm doing i'm doing the next jurassic park after this sort of thing um, <laughs> But who knows? I mean, maybe maybe we should come up with a, a, a pitch um, and and get them to do. It. But I've got um, plenty. But I guess no, what, I want to know where do you rank No Time to Die though on your like uh, list or your Dan your Daniel Craig list at least you know. On the Daniel Craig list, um, I would say Skyfall, Casino Royale, and No Time to Die are kind of equal ish mm -hmm. um i i generally overall i did like it i thought i thought the first 45 minutes were beautiful i think the opening scene what the, the music and everything else and them like on a sort of honeymoon thing i thought was really really good i just the the, the scenes the, the the locations and everything else and mm -hmm. yeah i thought it was fantastic you know the, the going the whole kind of you you see see his um, paranoia of of you know, who who is she mm -hmm. sort of thing going to the gravesite and the the explosion and then it kind of goes up a gear I thought was was very good um, yeah it kind of slowed down a little bit later on. Um, yeah, the Cuba bits I think were really, really good. I, I I've only seen it once, and I kind mm -hmm. of feel that I need to see it at least another time um, before I really sort of view. Overall, I, I I I quite liked it. There were moments where I kind of thought, mm, but more more to with things like I've already mentioned, like the whole 007 and giving it back to him. I think uh, and yeah the 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 villain i think could have been be better and there's a there's a few few things towards the end that i think were kind of felt like tacked on like mm -hmm. one-liners and so from like minor characters and things that i just kind of felt like uh that felt like they needed something i just come up with it on the spot sort of thing um but no i mean gem generally i i thought it was very good uh, what, 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 what about yourself? So, real quick, you're going to put Quantum of Solace last, then? I'm guessing. I, 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 I you think like Spectre more. I probably like Spectre more than Quantum of Solace, but it has been a while since I've watched it, so maybe I need to re reappraise mm -hmm. that. It's it's the least watched Daniel Craig film. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I should probably I should probably revisit it because yeah, sometimes you can okay. appreciate a film 
the third or fourth time to die you, you know you should get the watch out five one day just yeah <laughs> i'm joking just don't, don't spend 14 hours of your day that way i mean that's a, i've i've um, done the same with the uh lord of the rings extended well, edition we all have yeah those are great yeah. i mean gotta do that um I, I no time to die is an interesting movie again i've only seen it once so i have to see it again before i get mm -hmm. to uh if i, I mean I, uh, for me i mean casino royale and skyfall are, are just the pinnacle they're, they're mm -hmm. much higher um i have to see it again to decide where i want to rank the other with the other ones um you know a lot of things i like beautiful cinematography i mean again the filmmaking is great a lot of great acting some great plot points there was just a few things where that's why i like seeing films multiple times because the first time is more of an experience yeah because someone who makes movies too i watch movies so many times and i overwatch things because i realize you almost need to see a movie like you were saying four or five times so you almost see it as a filmmaker sees it because you see it multiple yeah. times and all and sometimes you think you get everything it's not until you watch things five times you go oh and then once you know how everything works too and you really see the mechanics of a film yeah, it's a yeah. lot easier to understand problems and realize like, oh, I had this issue, but in reality, I understand why they had to do this. And to fix that issue, I used to think it was all these things, but it's actually just this one little moment that makes this feel out of sync, that makes that feel out of sync. You know, you can usually start drawing those little yeah. you know, it, detective it's like, it's lines like, to the issues. It's like the film I love, one of the films I loved as a kid was uh, Predator mm -hmm. with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Classic. Um, yeah, classic. No, 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 no. And, you know, no, I no, no, no. literally, that is one of one of the handful of films that I have probably, without exaggeration, seen like 50 times. Yeah. Like, and it's only in the last few years that watching it has kind of spoiled it for me because I'm not watching it from a kid's point of view now. I am now watching it from the, you know, behind the scenes stuff and and reading about the, the problems they had with the, the vegetation and had to cut it all back because it was too much and the, the the actors getting like food poisoning and stuff so now now when i see it i kind of think oh i f i forgot how quickly how fast paced it is and now like uh -huh. they all they all die actually really like the first 20 minutes like they all virtually every single one of them is virtually dead and and, and how how the pace of it and it's kind of like yeah you see the mechanics of the, how the film is edited together and everything else um so yeah you, you yeah you have to see it quite a few times yeah. Um, so yeah, so may maybe the, maybe the, the, um, the judgment is out on no time. I'm just still oh. like on the end of the movie. It's not that I don't care that they killed him. I just didn't think they built up a situation where like I was fully on board. Like, you know, you want to be, when, when they do that in a movie to a character like that, you want there to be like, it's the only option and you want to feel that way as an audience. But I just feel like, I didn't feel like the stakes were as high as they could have been. Yeah, like you know, because he scratched him with that stuff. I guess the plot was a little convoluted with that stuff. Like, oh, you're gonna die because I scratched you with this thing, and you know, it's in your bloodstream, and which is like, okay. And then Q's like, he keeps saying like, it's for life. It's eternal. He says the words eternal, and I'm like, you know, I've seen a lot of these movies, Q, and uh, you come up with things pretty quickly. And you got smart blood. Mm -hmm. I feel like if for some reason Daniel Craig signed wanted to come back again, I would watch the next movie. You'd be like, ah figured it out I'd, it took me a little bit time but you know you've been in isolation yeah. for 18 months but whoop. yeah yeah so it was just like it didn't really as an i feel like at that point as honest, you want to fully understand and believe and be on board with everything happening and it was like that was there there's also the decision where he's like like just wait so you get off that it's like no do it now and it's like it just there's just a couple of things where it just didn't that moment didn't build to like what i want so when it happens i was a little disappointed because it didn't build to that final beat the way i felt like yeah. it needed to so i want to see yeah. it a second time because again even if i don't like it when i watch it multiple times i become more accepting of things and i want to see because i've seen the other bond films too many times it's really hard to compare like i've literally seen yeah like, yeah, yeah every other daniel craig bond film at least like i've like i've, I've seen specter even like eight times like i'm mm. that guy so like the fact that i've only seen this movie once yeah it's hard to have a full comprehensive uh you know thoughts on it but um I do like the hokier aspect of it. Like I do like the gadgets and I, I, I mean, I, I like seeing mm -hmm. that stuff and it plays well and I think he does a great job, but um, yeah, overall still got to see it again. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll tie it with the other ones. I'll say Casino sure. one and Skyfall I'll tie for now. Yeah. So, yeah. I, yeah, I, I would, I would agree with that. Well, we, we got there. We, we got to, got to the end. Um, well, this feels like a, a long recording. Um, thank I'm you. Gonna Sorry. Let, <laughs> I'm going to let you go, and thank you very much for for doing this, uh, James Bond uh, retrospective.
Um, Anytime. I would love to also say here, uh, Jurassic Park's my favorite movie. So when Jurassic World uh, 3 comes out, I would love to talk about that. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we could do that. We, we could do the um, Indiana Jones ones because they're talking about making that one, which would be what, number five? Um, yeah, they've already started shooting. Yeah, they're good. They're going. Yeah. So that, yeah, that would probably out soon. Um, yeah, well, we, we could do, we could do the Star Wars ones. We could do, um, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's tons of films where yeah. they've made several, you know, we could do the Terminator ones. Um, always down. Uh, yeah, it's, it's always fun. No, I've, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you very much for, for agreeing. Um, I'm going to go to bed now because it's uh, 11 o'clock now. Yes. Um, cool. Well, enjoy the rest of your